Hi, everyone. It looks like we've got a lot of people just jumping on. Um, thank you so much for waiting to get here. You are here. You are ready for positive language strategies for parenting. We are going to give it just a moment or two to make sure all of our registrants can jump on and then we'll get going soon. All right, I still see some people coming in. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to spend some time today talking about such an important topic. Um, my head has been spinning thinking about this, um, and I'm sure that yours is too. So sit back, relax. We'll be, be started in just a moment or two, and thanks so much for waiting. All right, for those of you just logging on, thank you for joining us. You are here for Positive Language Strategies for Parenting. I am so excited to connect with you. Um, I know Lauren, my partner in crime here, is also excited to connect. Uh, we are gonna get started in just a few moments. We've got a couple uh, people logging on and we'll just give it about one more minute and then we will get ready to go. All right, I think we are at about 1.04. Um, thank you so much for being here. Lauren, I think we should officially get started. Uh, welcome to the webinar for all of you who are um, jumping on. My name is Gretchen Richer. I'm the Director of Family Experience. And my, my partner here is Lauren Vien, Education Director at Rosenrex. I'm gonna have her um, introduce herself in just a moment. Uh, we're so happy to welcome you here today. Um, I am also son to four-year-old Noah, as you can see. I'm, I'm so happy to see so many familiar uh, names joining on. Um, but for those of you who are new to us, um, I'm happy to share that Vivi as an organization is on a mission to reinvent childcare and early learning for today's families. We're doing that a number of different ways. In New York, our three campuses and growing specialize in learning and care for ages six weeks to five years. And then nationally, our in-home programs, which take our teachers and really everything about the school model and place it inside your home, uh, expands our coverage to meet families literally and figuratively where they are. Um, we are so excited to get talking uh, on today's discussion, which is positive language strategies for parenting, an important timely topic that I know can have so many profound um, positive impacts along the way. And I'm so pleased to be sharing the space with Lauren Vienne, the Education Director for Rosen Rex. Lauren, I know you're going to share your background a bit in a sec, but wanted to share that Rosen and Rex is an amazing toy boutique um, offering curated contact, content and selection of elegantly designed toys that promote imaginative play, so aligned with what Vivi does. Um, and all of their toys in their collection are thoughtfully selected by education professionals, teachers, child development experts. I mean, they have an education director at the helm, which is so important to know. Um, all of this um, fosters a well-rounded skill building. And speaking of that, we are giving away a gorgeous and specifically curated Rose and Rex toy and parenting resource bundle at the end of this webinar. So please stay tuned uh, till the end to see if you have won. Um, and finally, just a couple of program logistics. We have about 30 to 40 minutes of planned conversation um, and we'll go through a great presentation that Lauren has uh, built for us. And inside of that, we'll bring up a lot of questions based on the wonderful submissions by you, the audience. You actually brought up a lot of questions that she's already gonna tackle. So I'm, I'm so excited that you are questions are aligned with the content. Um, and then we'll use the rest of the time to answer as many questions live as 
possible. That said, the chat function is open now. If you've been on a Zoom webinar before, you know the drill. So feel free to pop on um, questions as they come to you. If we can answer them during the process, we will. And if not, we'll try our best to answer um, at the end. This is a conversation that I know we can have for hours and hours and really go deep. And so two things I would say, remember just by being here, you're already chalking up a parenting win. Um, our goal is to take home a single word or phrase or single mindset shift that can set you in the right direction. And um, Lauren has so many other um, workshops through Rose and Rex um, where they really continue this journey one-on-one. -on -one. So if you are interested in having that conversation, please, um, we'll give you resources at the end to reach out. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lauren um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we'll cover and then really just dive into this great content. Um, yeah. Um, so for first, time. yeah, of course, of course. So do you want to give us a rundown of the agenda? Sure, sure. Um, also, as Gretchen said, I'm Lauren, Education Director over at Rose and Rex. Um, I wanted to share with you that I spent over 10 years teaching in preschool classrooms before joining the Rose and Rex team. Um, and now I am the mother of two young children myself. Uh, Henry is five and a half and Violet is three and a half. So this work that we do with parents at Rose and Rex with positive language is really blending, um, you know, what as an educator, Allie, the founder and I did in the classroom um, and helping it become accessible and really practical for the home setting. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll find a lot of similarities between home and school, um, and sometimes we need a little support bridging that gap. So today we are going to cover um, the benefits of positive language, both for our children and also for us, um, the adults, and also practical tips like safety and how to set limits using this approach. Um, also some tips for modifying for age and stage. I think sometimes when we see maybe on Instagram or in other social media spaces, um, you know, these phrases that um, parents are encouraged to use, sometimes they don't work depending on how old your child is or their language ability or just their developmental stage. So sort of some tips and tricks um, to shift your language or keep keep at it depending on what's going on. Um, we'll talk about what the difference is between positive language and negative language. Um, most importantly, that positive language does not mean you need to only be saying wonderful, loving things to your children. Um, we'll get to that. Strategies for specific challenging moments. So these are like go to the things I hear over and over again. Like, this is what I say to my child so many times a day. What can I say instead? Um, and then I feel like something that's really close to my heart, ending with a conversation about how perfection is not the goal, like why it's actually beneficial to our children if we don't use positive language 100% of the time. Um, and then of course, we'll have some time for questions and answers. I love that. Thank you for bringing the mom in real life element and the academic sure. element together. Um, it's so nice to know that you're going through this process together as a mom too. Definitely. In a setting for sure. And, and sometimes- um, Sometimes managing a class of, you know, 18, three and a half year olds probably felt um, less taxing than my two children that I have at home. Um, so it's really interesting to sort of be able to see it from both sides and be able to support families in that way. I love that. And speaking of supporting families, um, we've just popped a worksheet uh, that Rose and Rex has created into the chat function. Um, it's great to download now and take a look at, but it's also a wonderful asset to um, download later and save um, so you can bring this up and continue the learning. Okay, let's uh, let's put this into practice here. Um, the positive language practical tips. Talk to us about this. Sure. Um, so, as I said before, you know, using positive language doesn't mean that we're only saying positive, wonderful, loving, caring things. Um, you can say no using this approach. We should say no using this approach. Um, in the next slide, we'll define the difference between negative language and positive language. But for anyone who's popping on, who's unfamiliar with this approach, um, I assure you that your children will not walk all over you. They will have limits set. Um, I find that as a parent, my style is even a bit more um, clear and firm than people who might use lots of negative language or feel like they're saying no a lot. And we'll talk about why. Um, the thing that I wanna sort of start off with is everything you need or want to say to your child can be said using positive language. But when it comes to safety, we sort of have to figure out, you know, 
if for a clear example, an example of negative language would be don't throw your food and a positive alternative would be food is for eating. So you see that we're showing our children what we expect of them, what is the more appropriate or kinder, safer choice instead of emphasizing that negative behavior. So it's not wrong or bad to tell your child don't throw your food, but you wanna tell them what they should be doing instead. When it comes to safety, I don't expect anyone to see their child on a scooter, like racing to the street and saying, streets are for cars. Like you have to say what you have to say in that moment, right? So that's when we reserve, like if you need to say no, stop, don't, use it for those emergent situations so that you're not saying it so much that your child is tuning it out. Um, I, because I'm like a language nerd and very picky about these things, even in dangerous situations, what I use with my children is the word freeze because freeze is an action that they actually can take on with their body. It's not telling them to stop doing anything. It's telling them what to do. And when we practice something like freezing in moments that aren't dangerous or scary, like freeze dancing or freeze cleanup, where music is on and you're doing the activity and then it's off and you're frozen, then your child gets that self-regulation strategy and they can access it when things are actually dangerous. So safety, say whatever you need to say. However, if you brainstorm some of these, mm, you know, no, stop, don't running doesn't really seem so effective, or they don't really seem to hear it in the chaos of the moment, try something like freeze, because freeze is something that's really active, even for very young children that they feel like they're doing instead. Um, I, I literally wrote freeze, put a circle around you it, did. an exclamation point. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think you'll see, we talked about this, a lot of our parents have that moment of like, but what is the other alternative when the answer right. truly mm -hmm. is stop, don't. And I also, I think I heard you say when they're hearing no, no, stop, don't, to a certain point, they start to tune it out. So yeah. I, I like that you've said freeze is this very active word. Um, yeah. when really, they're not, it's not that they don't want to listen to you it's that they maybe aren't hearing you right and also there's a conversation among ed educators about you know when we lean on negative language especially in challenging situations we're really emphasizing the verb the action that we don't want them to do so when you say stop throwing blocks what they often just hear is throwing blocks they might not hear the don't or the stop because it takes them a minute to pause what they're doing or because they are just focusing on the action physical word. So for us, if you're telling them what to do instead, you know, that's where we're gonna get some results um, for them and for us. You know, when it comes to some, some parents will say, well, I feel like I'm using positive language or I'm trying to, but I'm saying the same things over and over again. And I feel like they're, I feel like it's not working or I feel like, you know, I'm seeing the same results. I feel like a broken record. Um, there's a few pieces to that. You know, we have to understand where our child is um, developmentally. Um, sometimes limit testing is part of their developmental uh, equation in life. And, and repetition is really helpful for children, especially when we're modeling language. If they hear us using certain phrases, there are two parts to that. You know, one is that their inner dialogue instead of someone telling them what not to do, and then they're focused on that negative behavior that we don't really want them to repeat, then their inner dialogue becomes like, walk please, walking feet on the pool deck instead of the stop running. So some mm -hmm. of the inner dialogue can help in terms of repetition. Also, we as adults and certainly as children need to practice things in a variety of settings. So you might say one thing in one place, but then your child needs a lot more practice when they take it outside of their home or when there's other people around. So it's okay. Repetition can sometimes feel frustrating to us, but it is really helpful to children when it comes to language. And the more that we model language and say to them, you know, you know, instead of don't grab the shovel, say, you know, tell her I'm still using it. Those kinds of, you can tell her, you can tell him this or that. Um, that's when our children are gonna be more independent using those phrases too. And that takes repetition. So we'll talk a little bit more about modeling language and how we can encourage children to use positive language to each other and how it gets your needs met. You know, Because if you're telling someone what you need instead of what you don't want, you're more likely to get what you need. It doesn't happen all the time, um, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. You know, if my children are arguing in a room and I pop my head in and I say, oh, remember, like I'm hearing a lot of 
don't do this. I don't like this. Remember, tell her what you do want. Tell her what you do need. And then at least they understand each other in that moment. I just scribbled that down furiously. That, that feels like something that both adults and children can really get behind is stop telling right. us what you don't want and to start talking about what you need. I love that. Right. And also the ripple effect in terms of home, like how it feels in your home in terms of the communication style. There's more clarity when you're expressing what you do want, what you do need, than that resentment factor of what you don't want, you know, even as a parenting partner, you know, if I say to my husband something like, don't put that cup there, it feels very different than, you know, oh, please just put that away when you're finished. Both might also feel a little bit like too much depending on your relationship, but there is a difference in how you're expressing it and also how it's being heard. Um, you know, when I say we aren't always going to get it right, I think that it's important when I share some specific swaps, like instead of saying this, try saying this. I don't mean it as a script. I mean it as try to do a little bit of detective work and figure out why this behavior is happening and what your child can do instead. So if there's anything that, you know, people who are new to positive language take away, you know, the bare basics are we're telling our children what they should be doing instead of what they shouldn't be doing. That is like very, very basic, but also, you know, that we want to figure out why these things are happening so we can replace them with something else. We're not trying to just stop a behavior. We're trying to figure out how our children can be independent and in choosing to do or able to do something different. I love that. And it's okay to just pause. We're going to, I think we're going to finish up with, it's okay if you get it wrong and here are some strategies right. to bounce right. back. It's good for them actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I love it. I can't wait. So you just you touched um, upon positive versus negative language. Let's explore this a little bit. Sure. So that example that I shared earlier too, you know, don't throw your food only negative because you're using do not only because you're telling them what not to do, not because it's negative or wrong as a parent to say that. Um, so some simple swaps, you know, don't do this. You can't do that in positive language. You're going to tell them you can do this instead. Um, you know, something like I just shared running on the pool deck. If you find yourself saying like, don't run, don't run, don't run, even just saying walk, please. It's a very, very simple shift, but it tells your child what to do instead. And the reason why this approach works for very, very young children, like just about speaking toddlers through much older children is because for younger children, it's confusing to be told what not to do because you're not getting any information about what you should be doing. So you're asking a toddler, a young child to do two things. Now you know that that's not allowed, but what are you supposed to do when you have that same impulse again, or when you have that same feeling or want again? And for older children, it lessens a bit of the power struggles that we see with children like Gretchen's son, I'm sure, you know, at four and a half, they're, they are supposed to be, you know, pushing limits and wanting to be more independent. But when they feel like we're hovering over them, there can be a lot of resentment. So you can express the exact same thing in a slightly different way. And then there's less of a power struggle. Doesn't mean that they won't be there, but it means that it feels different for him to hear and feels different for you to say. Can you share an example of that for the, the older kids with that power struggle? Sure. Some of the things like if I'm asking my child, like if I'm asking Henry at five and a half to like continue tidy up, you know, like those kinds of things, instead of saying, you know, don't leave your playroom until it's cleaned up. I can say when your playroom is cleaned up, then come join me for a snack. Um, I love the switch of when then instead of if then. Um, I feel like with positive language, once you start putting some things into practice, there's less threats. There's less, um, which most of us, like when we say them, it doesn't feel great to us, but we don't know what else to do, right? So I get in those moments where I'm like, well, I don't know what else to say. So I'm going to say, if you don't do this, then this won't happen. Um, but if you swap it and say, when you do this, like when you do the thing that's asked of you, then you know, you can do this other thing. Um, and then it feels like more of a challenge. Sometimes I'll add in like a, I know you can do it, or, you know, I wonder how quickly you can do it so that it doesn't feel like I'm already saying, I'm annoyed that this hasn't happened yet. Just by saying like, when you do this, this will happen. I bet you can do it. 
I was having this exact same struggle about a day ago and hoping that you would um, help give me some language. And I love the when then, because it, you're also setting a boundary so that if it isn't accomplished, you can come back to here's the boundary we've set and, and right. this didn't happen. So right. Then, then you can and that's also a more positive, meaningful way to set a boundary, because I think sometimes when we're struggling to find something that will work and we say, if this doesn't happen, then this won't happen or this will happen. As parents, we often don't want or even can't allow that consequence to happen. Like if you say, mm -hmm. you know, well, if you don't clean up your room, then we won't go to the park. Then if your child really needs that movement, you don't want them in the house for the rest of the day. So then what do you do? Do you not follow through? And then your child realizes that wasn't a firm limit or do you keep them in? And then it kind of like, no one gets what they need in that moment. So I feel like if you can rely on, you know, well, it's not a matter of doing it or not. It's a matter of when you do it. So when you do it then. And sometimes, you know, some people will say, okay, so what if they don't do it? What if they don't clean up? Then you find ways to sort of make it work. You know, then you go in and you say, okay, today it looks like it's really hard for you. Like meet them where they are. Sometimes the mess feels way too big. And as a parent, we feel like you made that mess. You should be responsible, but they're still being responsible if they clean up the blocks and not the stuffed animals. And maybe they take one and we take the other, or maybe we sit there and do our work while they are doing their work of cleaning up. Sometimes my son being older just wants the company. He just feels like he's missing out if we're in another room and he has to clean up this elaborate structure he built. So sometimes me just saying, you know, I have a couple things to finish up. I'll sit with you and keep you company while you do it is enough to sort of get it going. I love this. And I love that you're setting this framework um, when all things are sort of easy to manage, but we're going to get into more challenging situations, which For is sure. exciting because a lot of our um, registrants really had some questions about those, those challenging, um, right. challenging moments, challenging behavior. So do you mind if we go forward? The one other thing I just wanted to share is that, you know, in the beginning, it's going to feel like we're prompting a lot. We're going to feel like we're mm -hmm. often saying like, you can do this, or you should do this, or here's this example of what I expect of you. And some people feel like their child is going to rely on that and not know what to do when they're not there. So I think it's just important to share that you can prompt less as you practice and as your child practice. Um, you know, you're not supposed to use the same, not that you're not supposed to, but that you don't have to um, use the same language prompts over and over again forever for the rest of your life. Your child won't need them. You can even just do an experiment one day and say, you know, I'm going to go to the playground and sit in the sandbox and I'm not going to tell them what they should be doing here and see how it goes. And often they'll surprise us. And if they need a prompt, then fine. Um, so I think, you know, in the beginning, you might feel like you're talking a lot, but these strategies are going to help them be more independent and you will be able to talk less going forward. Because hopefully they're also internalizing the, that right. language. And, and if it's the positive language, they're internalizing what you've been saying to them. Um, right. So when you're working with families and they, they feel like they are just on repeat, on repeat, on repeat, is it more for you? Are you managing a parent's stress and, and are you just reminding them it's okay? I know it feels like you're saying this over and over again. This is, these are the right things to say keep breathing through Both. it. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I'll say like, that's okay for now. You know, this is very new to your child. Keep going. Um, other times I'll say, okay, so if you think that you feel like you're talking too much, then, then don't like, then don't and, and see maybe they need half the amount of talking or, you know, because I'm a big believer, like Gretchen, I'm sure you are too, of in simple observation. You know, we do have to sort of take a step back and see what are their skills independently and then meet them where they are. Do they need support in this situation or would they have figured it out on their own? We won't know if we're, you know, always there. I love it. Okay, so challenging. We, we could talk about lots of different categories and we tried to break them down into some popular mm -hmm. challenges. Yeah. I love the example of grabbing because grabbing is something that happens from babies to much older children. Um, and it really is an impulse control challenge. It's like that feeling that they, they need that thing right now. It's not even a want, right? It's like, I have to have this truck, like my life depends on it. Um, so, you know, we really have to be careful about saying don't grab because 
if we're saying don't grab, if you know your child and as the reach is happening, you know you're going to prevent it, you prevented that grab, but you didn't teach them what to do when they feel that impulse again. So this grabbing skill, especially if you have little ones, um, telling them who is using the item, having them be able to practice pausing and scanning a space and seeing what is available versus what is being used is something that will serve your child well for years and years. So instead of saying, don't grab, this is, you know, don't grab the truck from Henry, saying, Henry's still using that truck. I see the race car and the school bus are available. Your child might still cry for the truck, but you've done that step of saying, so-and-so is using it this and this are available. Sometimes you might need to try to give an extra support of, you know, do you want me to sit with you while you wait? Do you wanna ask the child how long will you use it? Or can I have a turn when you're finished? But the first step is really giving them the skill of scanning a space to see what is available. Um, you know, it's natural for a child to feel like everything should be theirs when they're toddlers. Um, but this is the kind of thing that after saying, you know, lots of times in lots of social spaces, like sandboxes, telling my child, another child's using it, this or this is available. I could see even at two and a half, he developed the skill to walk into a sandbox, stop and look around without me saying anything and then walk to something that no one was using. So that's something that you can really practice and a clear replacement. So we're not stopping the grab, we're teaching them to look for something else. Um, so you're not giving them all the answers you are having them come and sit back and observe so they can also right. find the answers for themselves. Right. And for families who have young children or maybe are even expecting and joining us today, some families will say, you know, well, well, how early, like what age do I need to start this? Like, when do I have to be really conscious of my language? It's never too early to start. You know, receptive language, a child's ability to understand language develops so much earlier. Um, than expressive language. So your baby understands so much more than they can say. So before your child is speaking, you can say these things, you know, your baby's going to try to grab, you can say, you know, mom is using this right now, you can use this or this. Um, and especially with COVID, if you're, you know, if you find that social settings are not happening as often as you would have dreamed of, then use yourself as that partner. And if your baby grabs something from you, um, you know, of course, playful back and forth is one thing, but you know, when a baby is like grabbing something out of your hands, it's okay to say to them, you know, I'm using this, so you can use this or this choose, and then put them so that, so the child can motion for what they want. Um, Thank you. you. You actually reminded me of something that um, someone um, filled out a question very last minute, and it was a really impactful. Um, let's say you haven't really been intentional about positive language strategies, and maybe your child is 12 months, 20 months, four years old. Um, mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity to course correct? Have we ruined them and their practices for life? Um, what would your advice be for those parents out there who feel like they, they might've gotten off track with their language? I mean, I would say that you probably feel that more than your child, um, but you can always shift your language approach. You can always start doing some positive language for certain scenarios that you don't love what you say and then not be as mindful in other places, of course. Um, I think the thing that is tricky is that we just have to be patient with ourselves as parents because it can take a lot of time to to change existing behaviors or habits that we have as parents. So I think sometimes when a child is older, it's just so immediate that it comes out of our mouth. No, don't stop. Um, but being aware that you're saying it is definitely a huge first step. So if there are some things that you want to change, I like to think, think about things like one week at a time. Like I'm very big on like weekly family challenges. So I would focus on, you know, if you're saying don't grab from your sister, you know, this week, just all week, try to say your sister's using that or even better, depending on how verbal the sister is, you know, saying, tell him I'm still using that or tell her I'm still using that to give them the words to say. Um, but yeah, I would take, you know, one scenario or one phrase that you're saying that you want to replace at a time. Um, and, and once you see how your child responds to it and how you feel, you'll be motivated. Um, it just takes time. Great advice. Great advice. One thing at a time. And negative does not mean bad, that you're doing a bad job. No, it just means you're telling them what not to do or what you're focusing on what you don't want them to do. Yeah. I love that logic. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Destructive, dangerous behavior, like throwing sand. 
Um, I feel like living in New York City, everything my children learned about socializing, they learned in a sandbox. Um, and as a parent, totally. I learned a lot as well. So, you know, when it comes to something like don't throw a sand, saying sand stays inside the sandbox, if you have a younger child pairing it with a physical gesture, like dropping the sand can really be helpful. Sometimes again, they might need choices. Like maybe you say sand stays inside the sandbox the first time. And the second time you say that, and you also say, um, you know, you can dig with the sand or fill this bucket with the sand, which do you choose? I love this example because again, it's a really great way to show meaningful consequences, like how to set limits and how do you follow through if you're reminding them in a positive way what they should do, but they won't or can't do it at that moment. Mm -hmm. So that's when I would say, you know, mama reminded you sand stays inside the sandbox. We're all done with sand today. Now you can play somewhere else at the playground. And then no matter what, the child is not going back in the sandbox. Um, I feel like often these situations are met with lots of tears or apologies, or my older son now will say like, I know I can do it now. Yeah. And, and I often will say, you know, to, and, and, and tone is really important here. I will say, you know, I know you can do it. You can try again tomorrow, or you can try again when we come back after lunchtime. Children need to know how long a consequence is going to be in effect. And time is really blurry for them, right? Like there is no concrete context of time. So something really specific of, you know, they can't play with blocks because they were throwing blocks. So you say, you know, your body was too rough with blocks. We're going to put the blocks away. After lunch, we can try to build again. Just tell them that you really know that they can make a different choice and tell them when that, that time will be. I really appreciate that you've escalated this situation because I think a lot of our families out there are saying, but what if I've tried the choice and I've tried the positive language and there's still a listening problem or they still aren't able to manage it at this time. It's great that you're still setting limits here. And right you're asking, okay, now it's time to be done with this and we're going to leave. And I, I love that it's all, it's all been done in a way that still gets you to your point and still sets boundaries. So, so you as the parent might still feel like, well, now at the end of this exchange, I'm still like physically helping my child out of the sandbox. They're weeping. However, that's what needed to happen in that moment. And the next time you go back, you can decide based on age or, your child's personality and how sensitive they might be. You could give them a reminder when they go in and just whisper in their ear, like, I know today you can keep the sand in the sandbox, or maybe you don't, because maybe that would bring up feelings for them and you just don't want to go there and just let it be fresh the next day. Um, but when we say meaningful consequence, it should be something that's related to what's happening. So you wouldn't say something like, you know, I reminded you sand stays in the sandbox. Now there's no dessert after dinner because dessert has nothing to do with sand. So even though it had, even though it might have an impact on your child, we really want to relate the consequences to what's happening so that your child will figure out how to do something different in that setting. Mm -hmm. I love it. Should we keep going? Yeah. Oh, whining was a big one that um our families wrote in please help whining us is this. always a big one <laughs> because also people want to say like well, what can I replace right whining with like what can they do instead they can use their regular speaking voice um you know you can try saying use your regular speaking voice please you could say it's hard for me to understand you when you whine um some parents feel nervous about labeling whining as whining because then children will think it's like this powerful thing they can do to sort of get under their parents' skin. Totally, um, yeah. At three and a half and five and a half, like my children know that whining is whining, but because I say, you know, I can't understand you when you use a whining voice or I can't understand you when you whine, please um, use a regular speaking voice. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes we have to think about these behaviors and like, do they really need to stop or be replaced? Or is it something that's driving us crazy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's, I try to tell myself they are trying to get their point ac across verbally. I would prefer that they speak in the voice that I know that they have within them. However, they're not pushing or hitting or being destructive. Like they really are trying to verbally express something. Um, sometimes also, you know, meeting them where they are emotionally, like maybe they're whining because they feel a lot of feelings. So saying, I can tell you really want this, whatever, 
um, please use your regular speaking voice. And then we try to move on. Um, sometimes they just sort of put that emphasis because they feel like no one's like really hearing them or really paying attention to them. And whining escalates when we're multitasking as parents. So sometimes if you stop, if you're able to stop what you're doing and turn to them and say, try again in your speaking voice, sometimes that's enough to sort of nip it in the bud. Yeah, I love that. So really exploring the reason why whining is starting. Are they hungry? Are they not getting attention? Yeah, so there's other things behind it. Um, this this could potentially escalate into something that we didn't put on here, but that um, like a meltdown situation mm -hmm. where it's, it's gone beyond whining. It's it's a it's a full blown explosion. Um, are you right. have you taken your hat off and you're not necessarily trying to talk your way out of the meltdown or or positively reframe the meltdown or are you just kind of looking at the situation first and then going in how have you given advice about I have I have one child to talking through a meltdown is helpful um where I helping that child identify his feelings is helpful and I I'm careful to say you know it seems like you're feeling I I don't say like you're feeling this way because not really sure. Um, and I've done that since my children were babies. Like it looks like you're feeling, or it seems like you're feeling. Um, because sometimes if you say, I can tell that you're feeling this way, they'll say like, no, I'm not, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so that is helpful for that child talking through even almost right away in the, in the meltdown saying like, well, how could we do this differently next time as a family? Like if I've done something that really upsets my son, he can say, you know, well, next time you can try this instead of this. I have another child who not because of her age, because of her temperament and who she is as a person cannot and will not talk during a meltdown. Um, doesn't want physical comfort during that time. So I have observed my children enough to know who needs more language in a meltdown and who needs less. Um, and for Violet, she has always needed just someone to be near her and let her know, like, I'll stay with you when you're feeling this way. Um, and I don't try to label her feelings. And she can talk about it maybe an hour later, um, but definitely not in the moment. I think being careful, um, personally, I try to avoid using the phrase, use your words. Um, you know, I think sometimes as parents, we use it in physical situations when you don't want them to use physical behavior, but it also is sometimes used in emotional moments where, where parents are desperate to know what their child is crying about. And they'll say, you know, use your words, like instead of crying, tell me what's going on. But if our children had access to their language at that moment, they would tell us what was going on. Like in times of stress, sometimes just like us, like they're not, they're articulate selves. So I try not to push either child to talk about what's going on, um, but I do stay nearby. And I do like this like strategy detective hat where afterwards we'll often say, you know, what was it about that that felt so much for you and, and what would help next time? Or what do you think we could do differently? Yeah, like man, uh, sort of in like the managing big feelings, like talking about those big feelings in a way that's more objective. And Right. Than what do you do with or... those feelings? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't even know right away why they were feeling that way. Um, I feel like my daughter with time can sometimes reflect back and, and say, but in the moment, I, I sometimes do not know um, what the feelings are about. For me, it's just most important to show her that like, I'm not going to send her away when she's crying. I'm going to stay nearby. Um, even though she doesn't want to hug, I don't take that as rejection. I just want to want her to know that, you know, I'm, I'm here and when you're ready to talk, we can talk through it. Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes the emotional stuff will escalate to physical stuff, right? Sometimes it's in those moments that we see children sort of lash out because they've reached this stage of being like very unable to regulate their bodies because of their feelings. Um, instead of saying something like don't hit, immediately saying your body is too rough calls your child's attention to their body. Um, you can say that as you are physically separating children. Um, it doesn't have to be less quick, less firm. Um, but for me saying don't hit again is really emphasizing the hit. And it also becomes like, I'm telling you what not to do, which of course I am, but I would rather have them immediately think about their body um, to get that awareness of their body. And then sort of translating why I think the hit happened is really helpful. 
Um, for younger children, like for a two-year-old, it the most important thing is to say, you know, your body is too rough. Um, and then as you get older, you know, saying things like, it looks like you really want to read the book. Um, you can ask her, can I have that when you're finished? So that they know like, yeah, I was rough. And also this is what I needed to say that I couldn't say in that moment. That's mm -hmm. where modeling language comes in handy. Anytime your child isn't able to say what they want to say, instead of saying, don't hit, don't push or use your words, telling them what they can say in that moment. You know, oh, tell your friend I was sitting in that chair. Like if a child approaches a chair and pushes another chair out, you know, tell your, tell them I was sitting in that chair, please move. Um, and if they don't move, then you get down on their level and you talk about, you know, this person was here. Can they have that seat back? It doesn't mean that you can completely put your hands up at, at the beginning, but for them to be able to have those phrases to go to in social settings is really helpful. And practicing at home is a great way to go. What if you are, thank you for that. What if you have siblings and, um, or, or friends and they're both engaging in the, an activity. So they're either both hitting or they both are going for the same toy and they're mm -hmm. both angry about it. Are you having that same conversation with, are you, would your directions be to give the, the same conversation? I might say, I might say your bodies are too rough. Um, you know, let's sit down and talk about what's going on here. And, um, and really these conversations are, you know, so much more effective if we're really sitting on the floor with the children or squatting down, everyone is eye level. It can feel really different when a parent is standing over you trying to help you get through a challenge, um, but to sort of all really be on the same level and, and, and it's hard when people want their voices heard, but I really try to give each child a turn to explain like what they think happened um, and, and sort of model some of those problem solving skills. Are you ever able to say, what are some of the things you can do? Is that an age appropriate, um, developmental appropriate, like asking them what other things could you have said or could you have done instead? I think with a child who either has a lot of practice in, in these kinds of conversations, for sure. Um, I think that if you really take a step back after any conflict and you ask yourself, you know, could I have said, said or done less and could they have said or done more? If you find that you're doing a lot of the mediating, then it's probably too big of a step to say to a child, you know, mm -hmm. what could you do or what could you say? Um, but if you feel like your child is there or maybe getting some practice out of the house, maybe they're practicing more at school than at home in these situations, then sure, you could always. Um, yeah, you can do a, a combination of saying you could say this and then also asking them, what could you say? Thank you. Um, this is so great. And uh, I know we've got a lot of challenging situations out there and we want to be perfect as parents. Um, of course. You've given us a little bit of leeway here. So tell us a little bit about um, how we can kind of manage through this as a grown ups who don't always have the right language uh, at the ready. Sure. Um, I would say that the seven out of 10 rule, it's this like rule that I learned when I was training to be a teacher that really stuck with me that, um, the gold standard, even for educators of people who like live and breathe language and education all day, every day, the goal is for seven out of 10 things that a child hears throughout the day, um, should be positive instead of negative. So for me, when I get really wrapped up in a particular moment, like my children go to bed and there's this like one glaring, maybe 20 minute stretch or like one thing that happened that I know that I didn't handle or speak the way that I wish that I would have. Like, of course that's where my mind goes. But when I remind myself, you know, seven out of 10, like think of the day as a whole, there is so much language in our homes from the moment they wake up till the moment they go to bed. Seven out of 10 is usually doable. 10 out of 10 is never happening, but it shouldn't. Because also we don't want our children to think that anyone can be perfect, but it's so valuable for them to see us make mistakes, to hear language come from us that maybe isn't 100% perfect and like the most thought out phrase you've ever said, um, especially if we can acknowledge those mistakes, especially if we can very concretely say, you know, I'm sorry, I used a loud, angry voice I was really frustrated. It was taking so long to clean up the playroom. You know, I'm owning that. I am sorry for what, whatever the behavior is. I'm sorry that I spoke in an angry, loud voice. 
and tell them why, you know, mm-hmm. I was feeling this way because of this, um, you know, that is modeling an authentic apology. Um, we could have a whole other conversation about um, alternatives to forced apologies, um, which I'm not a fan of, but this is a way to really show children what an apology is. You know, I'm telling you what I'm sorry for, I'm telling you why it happened, um, and not placing blame on them, you know, not saying I was frustrated because you took a long time to clean up, um, because that's another conversation. The point of this is to acknowledge your language and why you were feeling that way. I love that. So in the seven out of 10 rule, if there's a couple doozies that don't mm-hmm. work out, you're, you're as, as much as you can connect it to that incident, you're trying to come back and say, oh my Definitely. gosh, I'm sorry, this is what happened. Definitely. Great. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the moment passes and we might feel like we are at a heightened stage and we're not even thinking of that apology. Um, I think the younger the child, the m- more important it is to get that apology really close to the incident. Um, whereas now, um, thankfully, because I have plenty to apologize about, now at three and a half and five and a half, I'm able to, if I didn't get to apologize in that moment, um, you know, I can say, you know, I was thinking more about this morning, like sometimes after school Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. our way home from school, I'll say, you know, when you left for school, I was thinking more about this morning and it didn't feel good the way that, you know, our family left things like I wanted to apologize for this, whatever. Um, it's always, you know, the door is always open to say, I was thinking more about, um, and that can help us in a lot of situations. I love that. Um, now coming into the grown up space, and, and we had a, a question that actually came in about this. How do you, what's advice mm-hmm. that you have for someone who wants positive language with their children, but the spouse is not on board or less concerned, interested about using this language? So, um, how to encourage this to happen in all of the people that are interacting with your child? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, it really bothers me too when people speak to my children in a way that I would not. Um, I try to remind myself too, though, that I am with my children a lot and my partner is trying to use positive language and he, you know, is with my children a lot. Um, So I think that thinking about the overall picture of the language that's in your children's lives um, can be helpful because then you maybe feel less stress about a weekend visit with someone where, you know, a lot of languages you use that you don't love. That being said, you know, in terms of everyday presence, caregivers, if your extended family is a part of your life um, in a big way, then that's where sometimes if you really get down to the basics and you say something like, I find that she has been listening better also listening better. Like maybe I wouldn't normally explain, you know, describe my children's behavior that way, but um, saying, you know, I find that she listens better if I tell her what to do instead of what not to do. Or, you know, refer, like leaning on things you've learned or experts, you know, saying this printable um, PDF that was just shared in the chat, like having a tangible, hey, you know, I went to this workshop and I learned these things that I'd really love for us all to try them so that it comes off as like, this is something I want to take on together as a team instead of, um, you know, I know better or um, people are very sensitive about all things parenting, of course, but um, when it comes to language, you don't, you want to avoid having someone feel like they don't know how to speak to your child or have them be afraid to speak to your child. I met a woman at a children's museum like years ago with my children. She didn't know that I was an educator, but we were chatting and she was a grandmother with her young grandchild. And she was saying, oh, uh, I'm not supposed to say no anymore. So I don't, I don't really know what to say. And I don't know if she was told she couldn't say no, or if that's how she felt, because perhaps we right now are working on a lot of language goals that you know, generations earlier expressed differently. Um, So I think also saying, you know, it's okay to say no. And, you know, here's how we've been setting limits can sometimes help other people feel okay, because there can be a little nervousness about if I'm using positive language, um, I can only say good things all day long. I love that. I I also loved earlier when you said, um, take it a one week at a time. So having like Mm -hmm. one week goal. And I know for me, I'm going to go home and share with my partner. I love this idea of freeze. Can we try it Mm -hmm. together? And it's just one thing that we have to work on. And so if you're coming back to a partner, you're not saying I have this 
14 page list that I've learned and I'm, we're gonna implement right away. Maybe pick three things that we can get around together right. Um, right. And, and grow from there. So starting, starting small too. Right. I think if you experiment with putting positive language into practice at home, and then you spend time with other adults who feel like they are on top of your children with no stop, don't do this. Even if it's little things like, you know, banging into things in the house or those little things as a parent to me start to sort of add up because I know that my children don't normally like live in an environment where there is that energy around them. But sometimes I have to look at my child and say, they're okay. Like it didn't really bother them that someone said, don't put that cup there instead of, you know, put this cup somewhere else. Like, is it bothering me or is it bothering my child? Right. You know, at another right. visit, maybe my child I can tell is like very out of sorts because they feel like all day long they've been told what not to do. But if that's not the case, then I sort of have to check myself and say, we'll be home soon and I will continue with my seven out of 10. And it's good for kids to see people have different styles of communicating, especially when those different people are people that they love and care about right? It would be really hard for everyone in your life that you have a strong relationship with to speak in a certain way and then be introduced to something entirely different elsewhere. I love that. Um, thank you for this. And my, I have been viciously scribbling so many notes. I, I hope you've all out there been um, as audience members too. So we've got some time to talk, uh, put in some questions. So please feel free to jump on the, the chat function now. Um, it looks like we've added the link one more time for our amazing downloadable worksheet. So feel free to go ahead and do that. But if there are any questions for Lauren, um, we'd love to pop them up. Um, anything you've been thinking deeply about or something that she's touched on that you wanna know a little bit more about, Thanks. let us know. Yeah. As people might be typing, um, I know that something that had been submitted with registration was, you know, what do I do in these moments where like, I feel like I'm losing it. Like, I feel like I'm already starting to say things, but I don't know how to get it back. Um, I think I sometimes that. practicing this pause, you know, as I'm approaching my children, sometimes I feel even the way I'm walking towards their bedroom and I can tell that I'm already tense. I like give myself a pause and I ask, why is this happening? Like, what do they need right now? And the need could be emotional or physical, because sometimes if we think about the challenging behavior as, you know, an expression of a need, it feels very different than something that's happening that we have to stop or change. Like, okay, so why, like, why is this happening? And if you see the same things over and over again, shifting some things so that Maybe dinner needs to be 15 minutes earlier. Maybe they need 15 more minutes to run around. Um, those kinds of things. Think about the why. I love that. Take a breath. If it's not an emergency situation, you can like practice your, don't say this, say this. And, right. and then and right. re-enter the room. Um, interested, someone is interested in hearing the info again when it comes. Yes, there will be definitely a recording. I love that you're multitasking and I love that you're interested in it. Thank you. It's, it's so valuable. Um, looks like taking an hour every night post dinner to dismantle the house, a toddler. We know this. Um, throwing, going bonkers, positive language to be, seems to be futile at this time. I can't remove them from the space. Any tips? Sounds like maybe overtired or potentially getting into a meltdown. So again, we're going to take the language piece of like replacing the negative with the positive with like an actionable replacement. So if you feel, or if you've been seeing that your child is in like total destruction mode, then we just have to brainstorm some really destructive, but appropriate things they can do. Like, is there something that they can rip at that time? Can you put them in the bathtub with sensory materials and let them absolutely go wild? Um, think about what things they are. It seems like a, a variety of things they're wanting to dismantle, but um, if you look at the action of like, okay, they wanna clear the shelves, so they're doing a lot of pushing. So what could we do instead? Could we put on, ocean music and use our arms in those ways to swim. It sounds really silly, but it's meeting the physical need. Um, it, it also sometimes can be, um, again, like Gretchen said, like overtired or, um, you know, 
craving something that's different than the physical, but if they're throwing and the phrase that the parent used was going bonkers, my guess is that even if you can't remove the child from your space or go outdoors, um, if you could go outdoors, I would say like open whatever door you have to go outdoors and let them run wild. Um, but give them something else physical that they can do that will give their body that same big input as whatever they're destroying. Um, that's what we to do. I love that. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's one about um, teaching a second language at home, um, language and native language, but should we do likewise in English for partner and for friends? It's a great question. That is really great. Um, yes, I would say no matter what language we're using, we can always try to tell our children um, what to do instead of what not to do and help them replace these negative behaviors with kinder, safer, more appropriate alternatives. Um, the phrases don't have to match from one language to another. Again, like this is not an approach that has to be scripted. You don't have to find the equivalent to saying, you know, freeze or walking, please, um, instead of stop running, but the, that the, um, that the redirection should be similar, that we're, we're telling them what to do instead of what not to do. And you're welcome. Good luck, Aubrey, at night. I see Gretchen, you're on mute. Do you know that you're so on mute? So sorry, I, I was on mute. Um, no worries. My, I'm back, I'm back. So sorry about okay. that. No worries. Let's see. Any other, I think we probably have time for maybe one more and then I'm going to announce our, our winner. Oh, great. Um, any other questions? Really great questions. This is so good. Thank you. I, I know there's so much good stuff to talk about and go through. Looks like we have one. Um, yeah, any reframe when a child is hitting you, but you can tell that they want that connection. Mm. I mean, especially if there's a, um, like it's a younger child, toddler um, going through a phase of pulling hair or swatting at you and you feel like it is truly um, a connection, teaching them what to do instead. You know, uh, with my daughter who went through a, a hair pulling phase, I remember saying, you know, gentle hands, you can touch mama's hair, um, you know, and, and when we're really noticing that young children want a physical connection, but they're doing some things that are inappropriate or, or don't feel great to other people, um, I would make it less about like, I don't want my hair to be touched at this moment. Um, I'm big on those like conversations with slightly older children, but for a baby, I would, I would just switch it with something else. You know, you can tickle mama's shoulder. Um, if your child doesn't like a biting the shoulder phase, which a lot of children go through, you know, you can tickle mama's shoulder. You can kiss my shoulder with your lips um, instead of saying stop biting, because then you're also giving a lot of power to the biting or the the hitting too, you know, hitting, you can rub my arm. You can ask mama, do you want a hug? Um, those things can be helpful replacements. Thank you for this. And um, thank you so much. I want to keep learning from you. Um, I can't wait to take my scribbles and turn them into action. Um, I know we can keep talking and I hope we can talk again in the future. This has been so helpful. Um, as you can see, audience members, please keep learning from Lauren. She has so much uh, value to offer. And um, I would love to announce that Elodie Pair, I hope I'm saying that right, P-A-Y-R-E. Elodie, you are the winner of this amazing um, Vivi and Rosenrex package. So we'll be reaching out to you very soon so you can reap the benefits. Um, but really, truly, Lauren, thank you so much. This was a wonderful um, addition to our day and I hope we keep learning from you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren.